Shopping for and finding a solid student or intermediate grade trumpet or cornet can be really daunting because of how many options there are on the market. Generally, you want the best ratio of bang to buck for the best value. You want the instrument to play well at an inexpensive price point. And there are many different approaches to that that companies take. Some will manufacture the cheapest possible instrument that still plays okay-ishly and then present that to you with an attractive price tag. Others will seek to truly optimize the student playing experience and make it as nice of a playing instrument as possible, but then the price tag is, of course, not so attractive. Now, when it comes to bang versus buck and truly maximizing that in a way that you have a usable instrument for many years down the road, there are two companies that come to mind for me. Firstly, the Getson Company has some particularly fine student and intermediate trumpets out there. You can check out that review if you want to learn about that. But perhaps less surprisingly, there is also the Yamaha Company. Yamaha as a company are famed for their reliability and consistency and quality control standards, and the trumpet and cornet that we're going to be talking about today are both from their step-up line of instruments that I think really exemplify these standards. Stay tuned. How's it going, everybody? It's your host, Sam here. I appreciate you tuning in, and I hope you're doing well. I, for one, am very excited today because I get to welcome you today to Season 3 of the Scholastic Brass Special on the Samuel Plays Brass channel. As a reminder, two summers ago, we talked about a lot of different student instruments on the channel. Last summer, we talked more about sort of the mainstream step-up options, some of them technically being professional, but generally upgrade instruments for the serious high schooler. This year, I wanted to do things slightly differently, and it sounded like you guys all agreed with me in the poll. It was very, very heavily favored that I talk more about the value factor, that bang versus buck thing I talked about in my intro. That is what we're targeting this year. And that means this is going to be a little bit more spread out than the Scholastic Brass Special has generally been. We might talk about some student instruments. We might talk about intermediate and pro instruments. We might talk about some of the vintage stuff, to be honest. That's what a lot of this is looking like. But the real focus here is what is a serious instrument that a serious player can step up to, hopefully without breaking the bank, but primarily to make a really good, solid investment in their future as a player. That is this season's special. And the two instruments we're talking about on the channel today, I am very excited to show off. Once again, they are both from Yamaha's intermediate line of instruments, and I got them in total, the both of them, used for just under 500 bucks. And with that in mind, for the price point, they are outstanding players. And even outside of the price point, I would say they are quite good. But first, before we get too far into it, let's quickly go over a discussion of Yamaha's naming conventions so that we can have a better idea of what we're talking about here. TrumpetHistory.com, a site that's actually owned by a good friend of mine, has a nice and fairly succinct explanation of Yamaha's model naming conventions, their lettering and numbering. The first thing to note is we're going to be talking about a trumpet and a cornet here. The lettering, generally, is going to go YTR for a Yamaha trumpet, YCR for a Yamaha cornet, and although we're not going to have one in this video, you can go to that video if you want to see one, YFH for Yamaha flugelhorns. The numbering is a little bit less consistent, but nonetheless fairly intuitive. First things first, older Yamaha models from the early 70s up through about 1982 had three-digit model numbers, as do both of these instruments, and then in 1982 Yamaha switched to four-digit model numbers. The thing that has stayed most consistent throughout the years as far as Yamaha's numbering is the first digit always indicating the tier or level of the instrument in question. If the model number starts with a 1 or a 2, generally that's a student instrument. There's a Yamaha student model, if you want to watch that video, you'll notice that starts with a 2. When a Yamaha model number starts with the number 3, 4, 5, generally that's an intermediate or mid-tier sort of instrument. If you want to get really nitty-gritty about it, 3 indicates step up and 4 and 5 indicate intermediate according to the website. I think it's mostly a difference of era. A lot of Yamaha's older stuff started with 3s and a lot of their newer intermediate models do start with 4s and 5s. I don't think it's a huge difference between step up and intermediate, but nonetheless we'll make that distinction since it's on the website. Model numbers starting with 6 and 7 are generally standard entry level pro type instruments like the 6335H trumpet, which I speak very, very highly of. And then when you get to 8s and 9s, that's generally Xeno, Custom Z, artist type models, the more specialized ones. The next numbers do get a little bit fuzzy over the different eras of manufacture. The next one generally refers to the key of the instrument, so the second digit on both of these is a 3, indicating B flat, whereas 4 would indicate a C. Their soprano E-flat cornets are generally 26 or 86, that second digit being a 6 there. And there are correlations, but not 100% strong correlations, between the third digit and the bore size. So you'll note in this case that the trumpet is going to end in a 2, and that is a medium bore. 
Threes oftentimes are medium large bores, and fours are sometimes large bores, not always. It is the case for this Cornet, the 334, but we'll get to all that eventually. Now, I assume what you all are here for today is to actually learn about these instruments themselves. So here is the case for our first one of the day. You'll notice a red herring in the form of what looks to be a different nameplate on a Yamaha case. This says Nikon here, not Yamaha. And this actually does turn out to be significant. I wasn't entirely truthful. This trumpet is not really a Yamaha. It is indeed a Nikon. Now, Nikon was a small company based in Japan that Yamaha bought out in the late 60s or maybe as late as 1970, depending on who you ask. The owner of Trumpet History says sometime between 1965 and 1968. And this is in every way identical to a Yamaha YTR332, even though the valve block says Nikon YTR332. So let's take a look at some of the features of the Yamaha or Nikon YTR332, seeing as they are essentially the same instrument. Firstly, let's take a look at some of the colors here. We have predominantly, of course, the yellowish color we come to expect of yellow brass, which is 70% copper and 30% zinc. And we have a couple of accents here in the form of outer slide tubes made from nickel silver. But the most noteworthy material aspect is back here, the bell. You might notice it's a little bit more pinkish or orange than the rest of the instrument, and it is made from red brass, which is 90% copper as opposed to 70%. If you want a more detailed explanation of that, I know I'm going crazy with the plugs today, but there's a video up there that will help you in that regard. But the thing is, this is not just a red brass bell. This is a very thick bell with a large flare. This is five inches as opposed to the four and seven eighths that we typically find on student or intermediate trumpets. And Yamaha used some really heavy gauge metal back in this day, back in the 70s and 80s. So this is a very thick bell. And all three of those factors, the material, the gauge, and the size of the flare, all contribute to this being a very dark sounding bell. Now, an interesting little tidbit about this instrument is that despite it having a big bell, it has a smaller than typical bore at the valve section. Normally, student trumpets are 0.459 or 0.460 of an inch. This is actually 0.445 of an inch. As far as other features, we've got an adjustable third slide ring here, as is typical for most of Yamaha student and intermediate instruments. Whereas the first slide is not set up to be tuned on the fly, you'll notice I have to pull it out and leave it there. I can't adjust it via shunt or ring while I play. I originally wanted to flip this top tube here so that I could solder a saddle here and tune it on the fly, but that was before I realized, this sounds funny, what a historical artifact and what a rare sort of bird this thing is, being a Nikon rather than a Yamaha. And at that point, I kind of figured, eh, I probably don't want to modify it. I probably want to leave it as is in the amazing condition it is for its age and scarcity. Nonetheless, if you're going to look into a Yamaha 3 Series trumpet, I would recommend probably going with the 333 or 334, which, as far as I'm concerned, each have that shunt there. Now, dating this instrument is tough work for a couple of reasons. First things first, Yamaha were not notoriously very good with their serial numbering over the years, and also with this saying Nikon on the valve cluster. It's a little crazy to think, but this instrument couldn't technically have been made, at the very least after 1970. And so this likely originating from the 60s is pretty crazy to think about because it really doesn't have the typical hallmarks of what I would consider a vintage 50 year old plus horn going on 60. But nonetheless, that's what's being indicated to me here. I guess I just have to follow the facts and let my speculation die down. But nonetheless, the Yamaha YTR332 would have been manufactured between 1972 and 1977, which was sort of their first main generation of new models. Now, Instruments of the Day number two has all of the adequate Yamaha branding, both on the case and on the valve block. This is the Yamaha YCR334 Cornet. Now, this is up a very similar tree to the YTR332 in Yamaha's catalog, another Yamaha intermediate design. We've got a similar material here. We've got red brass once again. We've got another large flare, five and an eighth inches, which is really crossing over into specialty territory, if you ask me. And once again, the gauge is super thick. This thing had, you know, a fold in the bell that I wanted to repair. And so I took it to Clearwater Music, where I usually go to do these things. And I put all of my might and all of my bodily weight into rolling this thing on the dent roller. And I could not smooth it out. I had to bring it to my boss, who is stronger a frame than I am, and have her do it for me. Really, really embarrassing and humbling. Also worthy of note is the fact that the bore at the valve section in this case is actually a large bore at 0.462 of an inch or maybe 0.463. Nonetheless, here we have an adjustable third slide ring once again. We have the same stop screw, but we do have a water key on the third slide this time, unlike with the YTR332. And once again, unlike it, we have a first slide saddle, woohoo. Now this is a long model cornet, technically speaking, because it doesn't have a shepherd's crook at the bell. 
It's not really that long though. I would call it an American fat cornet rather than American long cornet because it's very tall and stout in the way it's constructed. I mean, look how much extra room there it is, how much clearance there is between my hand and the bell. So holding it actually does become a little bit funny if you have small hands like mine. Now, the big difference between something like this and a 332 is that this was not part of Yamaha's first generation that I mentioned between 72 and 78. This was part of the second run from 78 to 82. At which point Yamaha did a big revamp, they switched to four digit model numbers, they introduced a bunch of new models, and things generally changed at that point. But for those five-ish years, this thing would have been manufactured. Yamaha's first generation 3 Series Cornets were the model 332, much like that trumpet. Identical instrument, just I believe without the saddle there, so I'm glad to have a 334 that does have it. And then there was the 333S, which was a much more compact, shepherd's crook, silver-plated, brass band sort of design. And what's interesting and kind of cool is that Yamaha replaced that with the 334 and the 335S, essentially those exact same designs as the 332 and 333, but just revamped a little bit for a sort of Gen 2 re-release. So now that you've got a chance to meet today's instruments for each of them, I'm going to run some demos, and then I'm going to talk about my playing experiences in relation to those demos and other gigs I've brought them to. Let's get started. My computer just died. Now over the years, I've played a lot of Yamaha student model trumpets. I started out way back in the day on a YTR 2335. Since then, I've played other four digits like the 2330, which is a little bit more common. I've played some three digits like the 232, 233, 236. The Advantage model, the YTR 200 AD, that one's made in China, but it's fairly similar. And my impression over all of these models and most instances of all these models has been, oh yeah, this is a great starter instrument, can't really do much better at a beginner price tag. They really play quite well, they feel good over several octaves, there's a nice smooth feel throughout the range, it doesn't feel too notchy the way some student trumpets do. Uh, the one drawback being, aside from them maybe being a little bit stuffy at times depending on the exact condition, is their sound being just the tiniest bit tinny or too thin or too nasal or things like that. That's unfortunately the case for almost every student trumpet out on the market. I think Yamaha is better than a lot of other brands in this aspect, but still there is just that little bit of tinniness. The 332 feels similar to play, to all intents and purposes, to all of the 2 Series models. A nice smooth feel throughout the range, maybe a tiny bit stuffy up high, nothing too bad. But the sound is the real advantage of the 3 over the 2. I think the tinniness of all student model trumpets is all but eliminated on the 332. 
The fact that the bell has a little bit larger of a flare than normal, the metal is quite thick, and it's made from that red brass compound that has extra copper, I think that really, really does a lot. Now to tell you the truth, although this horn will obviously get you to the top of your range as will any other trumpet, so I was playing double G's and A's on it, I don't think it is really a lead horn. The sound maintains such a dark and rich core up until right around fortissimo. You have to push to get it to exit out of that territory, whereas a comparable yellow brass bell, particularly if it wasn't quite as thick or if the flare was the typical four and seven eighths, it would really start to brighten up around a mezzo forte to a forte. You would really start getting more of that lead trumpet sound at that point. This horn I don't think is the most efficient for that job. Even with a fairly shallow 1D, especially by my standards as someone who likes deep cups, the sound likes to maintain breadth rather than focus or brightness. So not a lead horn in that aspect, even if it will play high. I think it is really, really strong though for anything classical. It's good for a large orchestra because of the breadth of sound. If you're playing principal on it, yeah, use a C cup or shallower, don't go too deep on it. But for section playing in a big section where you really want the best blend and spread throughout, man, it is really good. But I think for chamber playing, it can also be really, really good. Where maybe you only have one trumpet player and you want them to blend with the rest of the instruments a little bit more than would be the case in a wind ensemble, for instance. I think there, such a thick red brass bell can do a really good job. I think this horn is really well equipped for anything desiring softness or spread or richness, those sort of qualities. So yeah, basically anything besides lead trumpet. Now at this point I've played a few Yamaha cornets, but certainly not as many as trumpets. And certainly back when I got this instrument almost two years ago, I had not played many Yamaha cornets at that point. The original reason I got it was because I figured a nice reliable Yamaha long model would be a good candidate for conversion down to the key of C, so that I could use it for church hems, certain orchestral excerpts that desire a lighter, softer sound. Uh, and then I got it and I realized, looking at the instrument itself and not photos of the instrument, that my perspective was a little skewed and it was not in fact an American long cornet so much as an American stout cornet. And that meant I could not take off the adequate amount of tubing 
at the tuning slide section or really anywhere else on the instrument to convert it to the key of C without it looking totally stupid. And at that point, I very frustratedly decided, eh, I'll probably try and sell it for the pittance I paid for it. But I gave it a little bit of time, I played around on it a little bit, I took it to a couple of gigs, and I figured that as an American design, it would have a little bit more of a straight ahead, maybe slightly brighter sound for a cornet. And I figured, you know, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world to have a semi-bright, semi-dark cornet, especially because I like to use deep mouthpieces on cornet that naturally darken the sound anyway. I was very, very wrong. This was not a brighter cornet. This is one of the darkest cornet sounds you can find on a budget. It is to the point when you use a brass band cup like the Dennis Wick 2B that I used of almost being a miniature flugelhorn. It is obscenely dark. Like seriously, if you didn't catch that, go back and listen with headphones because it really is stunningly dark. Yeah, with a shallower mouthpiece like a Bach 1C, the sound will become sort of big and bold and two-tonic, but that doesn't stop it from maintaining that really like I said with the 332, that big dark core to the sound until the very highest dynamics. It really is a stubborn horn, even more so than the YTR 332. Also sort of on the flugelhorn train, this cornet has a ridiculously open low register, and I absolutely love how the bell vibrates in my hands when I really push it down below the staff. It's a lot of fun down there. Now thankfully, I do all this flugelhorn talk, it doesn't blow or play out of tune like a flugelhorn does. Its blow and intonation are very much that of a nice, solid cornet. Quite well in tune, quite smooth across the octaves, not too restrictive up high. Like the 332, it's not the most efficient choice for playing high. It's really just, I mean, that's too big of a bell, too thick of a bell, moreover, to really get the optimal response up there. But again, it will play to the top of your range, and it's nothing too bad. It doesn't really get too stuffy up there, even with that Dennis Wick, actually. I can still play fairly high on it. Now, while we're on the topic of that 2B and other brass band cups, I think a deeper cup really makes this horn sing, not just on lyrical passages, but honestly, the technical passages, too, like the Swan Lake you heard. There's a lot of double tonguing in there, and the fact that you can get good clarity with that deep of a cup and the heavyweight blank and the heavy bell with the thick metal and the big flare and everything, you really can get a surprising amount of clarity with still a singing tone. I think it's a really, really amazing combo. I really enjoy playing on that cornet with that mouthpiece. Now, like what I said when I started this video, in season three of Scholastic Brass Month, we're gonna be talking a lot about what I consider to be the best value in the brass family. So get used to seeing this silly little thing, but I would like to give a hefty Sam seal of approval to both the 334 cornet and the 332 trumpet. Now with the latter, I will say, like I said earlier, if you're gonna go vintage three series and you want the red brass bell, I would personally say go for the 333 or 334 so that you have that first slide shunt. I think instruments that don't have them are really, really limiting in modern settings. I really wish I had a means to adjust my E's and my F's and my A's. Yeah, yeah, use third valve. Okay, well, third valve is a little bit flat. It doesn't resonate the same. I would rather just have the shunt and kick it out a little bit the way I enjoy doing on my 334 cornet. And this instrument, actually, I will not be keeping for much longer. I'm actually, once I finish this, just about to go pack it up. And it's a, it's a bittersweet goodbye, for sure. I really enjoyed this horn in the few months that I had it. I really put it to use as much as I could. I took it to some gigs. I took it to a lot of rehearsals so that I wasn't dragging around my shoe. And I really just enjoyed playing it wherever it was that I played it. I didn't really do much lead work on it. That may have been a different story. But nonetheless, lots of fun to play and quite an interesting and rare artifact that I hadn't expected, especially considering the price I paid for it. And it's now going to be going to a new friend of mine who is a band director and has students who apparently watch my video. So Jordan, or Mr. Miller, and your band, shout out to all of you guys. Appreciate you watching and uh, yeah, stay cool. I really do think that these two instruments and other similar models really display Yamaha's propensity for giving you the best value possible at their student and intermediate tiers. I paid pittances for each of these, and they really did serve me well. This thing is going to continue to serve me well. I wish I had more chances to use it. I can't take a cornet that looks like this to brass band, unfortunately, but it is a really fun instrument, and I take the excuse whenever I can to play it. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up and hope that Editor Sam can keep this video under like half an hour at this point, but Thank you for tuning in to the very first issue of Season 3 of Scholastic Brass Month on the Samuel Plays Brass channel. I hope you're looking forward to more. I know I am. And until next time, we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.